Felix Dulce and Rene Cornoyer were nominated for the Canadian Olympic team. Lucas Dowser won his fourth German national all-around title, and British and Chinese teams have been selected, but no one knows who made it. For those new here, my name is Kensley. I'm the host of Neutral Deductions, a podcast all about men's gymnastics. Today, I'm joined by former Nebraska gymnast and multimedia contributor Gabe Sanchez, who has been on-site covering Canadian nationals this past weekend. This is episode 35, where we are going to focus on the Canadian and German national championships. This is the Neutral Deductions Podcast, men's gymnastic news, coverage, and analysis. At the Canadian National Championships, Felix Dolce won the two days of competition, and he won it ahead of 2020 Olympian Rene Cornoyer. According to Gymnastics Canada, by placing first and second in the all-around, both Dolce and Cornoyer have qualified to be nominated for the Canadian Olympic Committee for the team in Paris. So after the competition, they both did an interview with Neutral Deductions where Dulce and Cornoyer spoke about their all-around battle. And Dulce in particular mentioned knowing that he and Cornoyer were competing in the final rotation at the same time going head to head. And he heard the crowd erupt for Renee's performance on vault. And he knew that he had to hear hit his parallel bar routine. So what else stood out to you, Gabe, at the competition and in their interview? Well, it was a really exciting competition between those top two all-arounders. Felix ended up getting the top score on day one, and then Renee came back and getting the top score on day two. Uh, Felix ended up taking the overall title, which is a little bit higher combined score, but it was still really, really great to see both of these athletes battle it out. So Dolce has the higher difficulty overall, but he does struggle on pommel horse. And while he's not highly competitive on the event, he has shown improvement from 2023. On floor exercise, Dolce prefers front tumbling. He opens with this really nice front fold, a front double bike. And while he prefers front tumbling, he was still able to finish the routine with a triple fold, which he's stuck on day two. His high bar is also really exciting. He has a Casina and a Coleman. I interviewed him and he said that he's been training to connect both Kovacs variations along with both of his Takacha variations, so that might be something we could see in a final situation. I think he's also improved on rings, where he showed really clean work both days of competition. You could see on day two that he did begin to lose a little bit of steam. He came into his crosses a little bit low, and he had some short handstands on P-bars. That meant that he opened the door a little bit for his teammate, fellow Quebec athlete, Rene Cornoyer. So Rene actually had the highest all-around score recorded at the competition with an 84.348. Rene is a really consistent athlete who can score 14s across the board with the exception of Pommel Horse, which is an event that Team Canada struggles on. His highlights include still rings. He has some really impressive Maltese holes, but he's also able to really control his rhythm. I could not see any swing on the rings, so it was really impressive to see that. Rene has a great double front on vault, and he has a really consistent floor set. On floor, he easily sticks his dismount a half and a half out, and it's really cool to watch. I think you should expect both of them to be in contention to make the all-around final in Paris. Even with those two athletes, there were two other athletes that made really, really strong cases for themselves. William Mard and Sam Zakutny both feel like locks. Mard showed really strong routines on four still rings and vault, and Zakutny has a very, very good high bar set. It would be really shocking to see a Canadian team without those four athletes. Yeah, I think it's really interesting specifically about Will because just prior to this competition, I think 12 weeks prior, he tore his bicep and we were like, is he even going to be able to compete? And not only did he come out and do really incredible gymnastics, he placed third in the all around. Although I do think he did say in an interview with you that he did downgrade his still ring set. So to accommodate his bicep injury. Yeah, it was really impressive to see him fight through that injury, but he was still able to get one of the top scores on rings, even with that lower difficulty. He only did a 5.0, but it's still a really, really beautiful set. 
So tell me a little bit about the Pummel Horse contenders, because going into this competition, I think most people felt pretty sure that one of the spots on the Olympic team was going to go to Jason Rampersad or Zachary Clay. They had both had really great international success last year, and things did not necessarily go according to plan for them in this competition. Yeah, it was a little bit of a shakeup because of the results that we saw. Just a flashback to last year. Both the Pan Am team and the World team both included both of those pommel horse specialists. And neither one of them was really able to deliver a solid performance. So Zachary Clay scored a pretty reasonable 13.966 with a 5.7 D, but he was only able to do that one day and he fell another day. Then you have Jason Rampersad, who did the highest D score out of anyone in the competition, the only gymnast to record a D score in Pommel Horse over 6.0, but he was not able to hit his routine either day. Someone who I wasn't really on my radar, but really impressed was Aiden Lee, who competes for Cal in the NCAA. He was able to record a 14.3 on day two with only a 5.5 D. So that was a really impressive score. But unfortunately, he only hit that once. And the other day he fell. So you have this mix of pommel horse specialists who are very good at the event, but none of them really felt consistent and that you could trust them to deliver in a high pressure situation. So I'm I'm curious because there are different schools of thought on how to select an Olympic team. Do you take into account past international results or do you only focus on what happened in the two qualifying competitions? And I know Eddie Van Hoof ha- has been leading the Canadian team for quite a while now, and I'm curious what... Um, what his thoughts were. And, and for those of you who don't know, Eddie Van Hoof is effectively the Brett McClure of uh, Canadian uh, gymnastics. So what did he have to say about what he was looking for at this competition? Yeah. So uh, I know that the criteria was written down, but I kind of wanted to get more details of what he was looking for. So we nominated the ranked one and two mm-hmm. all around would be nominated to the selection mm-hmm. We have a selection working group that will meet and look at the, the balance in the makeup to be able to three places. Everybody loves to do trick, and that's always been the case, but tricks don't actually even be from system. It's great fun, the sport has to be fun, but there also has to be a discipline to the sport in terms of training. And we have a common saying, a couple of common sayings, use them in Britain, every go counts. Training is for competition. Not for brain set. And I know it's going to be the Olympic Games and everything that goes around, but it's going to be to the World Championship. In some ways, this situation is more stressful because of that state. So, so that's why I say it's the Olympics. That's easier to control. We decided, I decided with some consultation that we would just use nationals to, because it's a two day event. And partly it's, it's, the whole point of consistency and repeating your work and not having one good day and then a disaster. We're looking at the idea as a man of to go out and compete any day, but they've known these dates in that document mm-hmm. for the other year to know, but also it puts them under that pressure, if we want to call it pressure or that level of expectation that they have to produce for the earth, because if they actually make it here and cope with this, then actually completing that we're in big danger than the easy. Because you've already done the hard there. So we've covered the main all-arounders. We've co- covered the pommel specialist. Tell me about maybe some of the other all-arounders or people that you think are in contention for that Olympic team. So I think one person that we really have to mention is Yanni Konopoulos, who competes for Nebraska in the NCAA. He was someone who hit 11 for 12, so almost a clean two-day competition. And like we said, Eddie was really looking for gymnasts who were consistent. Yanni also finished third place in the overall standings on Pommel Horse. And like we mentioned before, that's a really big gap for Team Canada right now. So I think he's definitely in contention for those spots. 
Okay, so you mentioned one NCAA gymnast, and I know that there were a couple others there. So what about Evgeny Semenyuk from Michigan? Yeah, he was also really impressive. He has really good parallel bars and high bar combo, and he actually scored pretty well the second day of competition in the all-around. And I think he should not be ruled out as a possible athlete to take the alternate spot. Yeah, I think it's it's very interesting. They'll they'll have a hard selection on their hands because all of the athletes really have been improving. And then, as you mentioned, you have Yanni, who is this power gymnast who came in third on Pommel Horse, an event where they really need someone. And then you have someone like Evgeny Simonyuk, who is incredibly strong on the bars, on parallel bars and high bar. And so you have these gymnasts who almost together would make an even better all-arounder. And mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see what direction the um, the selection committee decides to go. So some other athletes I just wanted to point out that showed some really great work was Chris Kaji, who showed a really nice vault and some really solid work on still rings he actually won the still rings event title la andre suave was also really impressive especially on floor and vault he won the vault title but that was mostly because he was the only athlete to compete two vaults but on floor he has a really artistic routine so think of a routine like maybe sam phillips of nebraska or even early 2000s sydney olympics alexei namov some really cool style points i want to give to him It's going to be really interesting to see how they're going to name this Canadian team. When are we going to find out when that team is named? So internally, the team is going to be named June 12th, and then they will recommend those athletes to the Canadian Olympic Committee, and then the team should be made public soon thereafter. Neutral Deductions recently launched this year and is entirely funded by listener contributions. If you'd like to support the show and help promote men's gymnastics, kindly consider making a donation through the PayPal link provided in the show notes. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you. So it was really great to travel up to Quebec and see this competition live, but I was pretty occupied covering it. Uh, Kenza, you were able to actually watch German Nationals while I was in Canada, right? Yeah, I did take a moment to watch the German Championships, which was great. They had a free stream. They had free live scoring. It's exactly as gymnastics competition should be, in my opinion. And um, so the exactly as you mentioned, the competition took place the same time as the Canadian Championships. It was on June 8th, 2024, was the all-around and Olympic silver medalist and world champion Lucas Dalzer brought home his fourth national all-around championships this past weekend, and he won it ahead of his German teammate and other Olympian, Andy Toba. And interestingly, in third, we had junior world silver medalist Timo Ader, and I think this was a little bit of a surprise. I think most people were thinking that Pascal Brendel would probably come in third, but it was, it was great to see a young athlete like Timo come in and put such a strong performance. So when I was reading through the different articles to understand better what, how Lucas and Andy were feeling, Lucas said in an interview to the Frankfurter Allgemeine that the burden and the pressure now feel like they are off and that he can go into the next few weeks a little bit more relaxed. And he also told the DTB that this title means a lot to me. The first title that you win is probably always the best, but for me, it is the last one that is also really nice. At least I will not be doing any more all-around competitions apart from the Olympic Games. So he's announcing that he may continue in gymnastics, but he will not be doing the all around anymore following Paris. So Andy Toba, he actually said something really similar. He said he felt like a lot of pressure was off of him. And he said, everyone expects Lucas and me to automatically qualify as pillars of the team, but it's not that easy. So Toba, no stranger to injury. Um, Everyone saw his injury at the 2016 Olympic Games. Um, His latest injury was last year at the 2023 World Championships. He was not able to compete as a team, um, as a member of the team in the World Championships last year. He said it's been the hardest five to six months of his life that he has been struggling to come back. And so for him to come back and play second and be challenging Dowser was incredible. 
Dowser himself was struggling with the flu and a bacterial infection that caused him to miss the European Championship. So for him to come back and win, again, a huge, huge struggle. Um, I do want to also mention that right before the competition, Nick Klassing ended up withdrawing from the competition due to a shoulder injury. It hasn't been stated to my knowledge how difficult his shoulder injury is, and this would be a huge blow to the German national team. Klassing was obviously integral in helping them uh, win a team spot for the Olympic Games last year, but maybe he'll be able to compete in the final event, maybe not. So Delzer also took the national title on parallel bars with his signature event. And on day two, he actually ended up performing better in the event finals than he did at the all-around final. He got a 15.5, which was almost a point and a half ahead of Glenn Trebing in second, which is a crazy margin to be ahead of in front of uh, between first and second place. And interestingly, each of the six events was won by a different athlete. So Pascal Brendel won floor with a 14.325. Daniel Musashides won pommel horse with a 14.225, which I also find really interesting. So he won floor last year at the German Nationals, but internationally, um, he's been much more known for his floor work. So I just found that one a little bit interesting and had certainly expected Niels Dunkel to take that title. Archer Sahakian won rings with a 14.050. Felix Ramuta won vault with a 14.025, and then Andy Toba ended up taking the high bar title with a 14.475. These championships served as the first part of the German Olympic qualifications. The second part of qualifying will take place June 22nd, and in the German selection procedures, they indicate that athletes who demonstrate a medal-winning routine at the two qualifying competitions will be selected for the German Olympic team. And they have this table within their selection procedures that sort of indicate what they're projecting a medal to be at Paris. And only Lucas Dalzer reached that feat on parallel bars. And since he's already demonstrated his potential at a major international event, should he repeat the results that he had at the second qualifying event, he will be considered a lock for the Olympic team, which I think is hilarious. Even on the broadcast, they were saying like, oh, you know, they were sort of considering like Dal Dalzer may be a lock or not. And I was like, no, no, no. Dowser's 100% on this team. There is no question about that unless he gets injured. Um, so I found that very funny. The German selection committee will use the data from the two competitions to select the highest scoring team. And then if the results aren't clear, then they will consider some discretionary criteria, including athletes' abilities, um, if they have any restrictions, and then their ability to perform under pressure. Um, according to the CDF Heute, they said, should the performances be repeated in the second qualifying event, Dowser, Toba, Ader, and Brendel will definitely be in Paris. And then the fifth spot, as is the case for so many teams, seems to be a mystery. Neutral Deductions is your exclusive gymnastics news platform focused entirely on men's gymnastics. To show your support, please subscribe to Neutral Deductions' YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram. So we just got to see a sample of what the German team's going to be like and a sample of what the Canadian team's going to be like. Do we have an idea of what Team China is going to bring to the table? Okay, this is actually really interesting to me. So China had their final uh, selection event also this past weekend. So remember, um, so Jing Yuan has already secured his spot on the Olympic team. So four spots are up for grabs. And there have been no whispers as to what happened, what the results were, who's going to be on the team. And this is very different from last time. So um, for those of you who don't remember or who weren't around in 2020, there were a ton of leaks from athletes in China, which is very, very unusual. And it's because the, the choice for the Olympic team was extremely controversial in that Zhang Bohang, who was world champion in 2021, was later left off the team. So he was world championship in 2021. He didn't get to compete at the Olympic Games. And people were very upset about this. This year, nothing. Not a zip. No leaks. No results. So they are keeping things very, very close. So it'll be very interesting to see who will actually make that team. Uh, now, a 
team that maybe seemingly has had some leaks, <laughs> like the Chinese is the British team. Um, so I'm curious if you were to name a British team, like who would you say are the locks for this team? So the obvious answer is multiple Olympic champion, Max Whitlock. I think world champion on P bars, Joe Frazier is also a pretty secure bet. And also world cha champion Jake Jarman, who just won vault at the last world championships, is also a pretty good bet. But from there, it would get a little bit complicated. Who do you think are the next people in running? Yeah, it's really interesting. I I also would say, yeah, Max, Joe, Jake should be secure. Although very interesting at the latest competition that Max competed in, he only did like a 4-8 difficulty on pommel horse and scored in like the 11s or 12s. It was really not good, really uncharacteristic for Max. And typically, you know, his D score is 6-8, six, 6-9. Six, He's scoring well into the 15s. And so we know he has an injury and I'm curious, like, okay, how bad is that injury? Will he actually be named to the team? Um, I think he should probably be named to the team unless medical information dictates otherwise. But that has just sort of thrown a wrench in my, this is solidly who I believe is going to be on the team. Um, but aside from that, in sort of that next category, I think James Hall, Harry Hepworth, and Courtney Tolick are three people heavily in the running for two, those last two spots. And interestingly, today, Olympic medalist Niall Wilson released a picture with Courtney in it saying he can't, he's like so excited for Courtney and can't wait to see what he's doing in Paris. I'm like, oh, did, did Niall just accidentally let it slip who's on the Olympic team? Um, so that's really interesting. And then another person I would say is in the mix, but I'm not sure how heavily they'll consider him is Luke Whitehouse. So Luke is two-time reigning European champion on floor. He beat a reigning Olympic champion, Artem Dolgopiad. And so I kind of wondered, okay, is he going to be able to make a last minute push to the team? But it, I, I'm not sure because Jake and Harry are both so strong on floor and vault. And it's like, okay, do you want to add another person onto the team who's strong on floor and vault? It feels very much like the Michaela, Michaela Skinner, Jade Carey, Simone Biles situation in the U.S. in 2020. Like, why did you, I mean, it ended up working out, but initially it was like, why did you give a spot to a floor and vault specialist when you already have two people who are exceptional on floor and vault? So anyway, those are sort of the only seven people I could imagine potentially being on the team. Uh, we will officially find out on June 13th. So the team itself has known for about two weeks. And the reason they have this waiting period is because athletes are allowed to appeal the decision. To my knowledge, I don't think any appeal has ever worked. Um, so we'll see on the 13th uh, what ends up coming from that. So um, a couple other things to talk about. When you were at Canadian Nationals, I know that you got a chance to talk to um, Jordan Gerenstrom or maybe at U.S. Nationals, you talked to Jordan. Um, there's a universality place was officially awarded to Elise Najjar of Michigan. Can you tell me a little bit about what Jordan said and how he Lace ended up getting that spot? Yeah, so this was the last name place to be awarded for the Paris Games. Lace was named to this spot because he represents a country that had low participation in the Olympic Games. So he represents Syria on the international level, and he had a strong enough performance at Asian Games that the Olympic Committee thought he would be the best rep representative to take that spot. I asked Jordan Gerenstrom, the assistant coach and Lace's personal coach at U.S. Nationals, and here's what he had to say. We're, we're so honored and thrilled that Lace was selected. It means a lot, not just to Lace, his family, the country, but to our program too at the University of Michigan. So we're very proud of him. Him and I talked earlier today. He was, uh, I, could, I could hear him smiling on the phone. That's, that's, if you know Lace, you know he smiles 24-7. Um, you know, and, and I think that in the last two weeks since him and I were in Uzbekistan for Asian Championships, it's been uncertain, right? There's yeah. uncertainty in the air. He didn't know whether or not he'd be selected. Um, and he knew if he was, his dream would come true. Today was the day. Lace is ready on all six. Lace is so capable of a lot of amazing gymnastics. Look for some new skills that he either hasn't competed yet 
or will compete in the future on the parallel bars in the floor exercise. Yeah, it's so good to hear from Jordan. Jordan and I, again, we're at Michigan together, so it's always nice to uh, see him at, um, at different competitions. Michigan could end up having athletes in up to four different countries this year in Syria with Lace, Belarus with Kevin, um, Evgeny and Canada, and then, of course, the, the two athletes vying in the U.S., Frederick and Paul Judah. So very, very interesting. Um, the final thing we'll touch on is the French championships happened this weekend. So Leo Salandino won the senior division with an 82.533 and Anthony Mansard won the junior division with an 80.366. So if you would please rate and review us on Apple podcast or wherever you get your podcast, if you're listening on YouTube, please like, and subscribe. It really helps others find neutral deductions and learn more about men's gymnastics. If you would like to help bring more live men's gymnastics coverage to life, please consider donating a massive thank you this week to Elena, Shelly, Samantha, Saul, Susan, Joyce, Tracy, and Patricia, who all donated in the last week. We are entirely listener supported. And at this point, even $10 helps us cover a meal. The PayPal link is in every show note and at the bottom of every article on neutraldeductions.com. You can donate via PayPal or Stripe. If you have any questions, comments, or insider tips, you can email us at neutraldeductions at gmail.com. That's all for this week. We'll see you next time.